Hi, I'm Dr. John Hovanesian. In cataract surgery, consistency is the key to achieving predictable results. In this video, we're going to talk about five different steps to performing consistent cataract surgery for improved predictability. Whether you're just looking to tune up your surgical results or you're taking on a new challenge like limbal relaxing incisions or toric or presbyopia correcting lenses, the tips in this video should help you to perform more consistent procedures to get the kind of results that you and your patients are going to love. From start to finish, cataract surgery involves a lot of steps and for a perfect result, all of them need to be perfect. In this video, we're going to focus on the five steps shown here. These are the steps I consider most important. Marking the cornea, wound construction, capsulorexis, irrigation aspiration, and wound closure. The most common mistake surgeons make at any step is to be focused not on what's happening now, but what's coming up in a few minutes. This leads to mistakes and inconsistent surgery. The famed Notre Dame football coach Lou Holtz was known for teaching his players that to win, you have to focus on what's important now. This approach makes a lot of sense for surgeons as well. We always get the best result by staying on task. Step one is careful wound construction. The side port incision needs to be large enough to easily accommodate a left-handed instrument and viscoelastic cannula, but not so large that it allows shallowing of the anterior chamber because of excessive fluid leakage during the procedure. Filling the anterior chamber with viscoelastic is best done by advancing the cannula about two-thirds of the way across the anterior chamber and then injecting a small amount. Next, advance the cannula into the body of the already injected viscoelastic as you continue to inject. This creates a single and cohesive mass of viscoelastic rather than separate strands that sometimes obscure your view. Also, don't overfill the chamber. Just fill enough to maintain its natural depth. When you overfill, the high pressure that you create makes the viscoelastic leak during your rexis, which creates more problems than you'd have with just a modest injection. For the main incision, regardless of the incision size, I prefer a two-plane approach. This diamond keratome from stores creates an incision of 2.8 millimeters. Enter at the limbus and aim toward the corneal apex to achieve a fairly square configuration. Then before entering the tissue, point the tip posteriorly so that it will create a second and vertical plane to provide a watertight seal. A note about the axis of incision placement, if you're treating astigmatism with your main incision, it makes a good deal of sense to place it so that it will either be exactly on the steep axis or exactly 90 degrees off. This way, the incision's flattening effect, usually about a half diopter, can either be subtracted from the preoperative cylinder if you're on axis or added to it if you're 90 degrees off. Either way, you'll know how much astigmatism remains to be corrected with your LRI or your toric lens. For a full description of how to correct astigmatism during cataract surgery, see my video on limbal relaxing incisions. Step two is to mark the cornea for a precise capsulotomy. Capsulotomy size and centration are really essential to the final lens position, so if we want a predictable result, we should mark. To do this, use a circular marker like the Wallace capsulorexis gauge shown here, which is designed to place a 6 mm circular mark on the cornea without ink. This mark will guide your rexis and then become almost invisible shortly thereafter. To make the mark, have the patient fixate just in between the microscope lights, then estimate where the center of the undilated pupil would be. That spot might correspond exactly to where you see the center of the reflections from the microscope lights. If so, that's where to center the marker. If the two spots, that is the pupil center and the microscope light reflections, don't match up, you should probably split the difference and center the marker between these two locations. To make the mark, leave the cornea somewhat dry and indent slightly with the instrument. The mark it leaves will remain transparent but visible for a few minutes, even after wetting the cornea. Okay, step three is to make a perfect capsulotomy. Many surgeons like to use a bent cystotome needle for this step, but I prefer the control of the Silverstein micro incision forceps that are shown here. Because of their size, these can be used either through a micro incision wound as well as this 2.8 millimeter opening. Following the mark on the cornea, there is really no guesswork as to where and how to place the rexus. If you create the rexus just inside the 6 millimeter ring on the cornea, you'll end up with a near perfect 5.5 millimeter capsulotomy every time. And that's perfect for most lens implants we use today. Hydrodissection should be done with a blunt cannula that goes just under the edge of the capsulotomy, lifting or tenning up the edge, and then advancing just far enough to be sure that the onrush of fluid will stay under the capsular edge. 
Injecting quickly is preferred because it uses less fluid and it generates enough force to extend all the way around the lens posteriorly without over distending the capsular bag and potentially breaking it. This approach will minimize the amount of cortex to be removed by INA at the end of surgery. Finally, before you remove the irrigating cannula, gently press on the lens to slightly rotate it and verify that it will spin. How you remove the nucleus and the epinucleus of the lens is subject to a lot of surgeon preference. I like to use a divide and conquer technique using a second instrument that's a bulbous chopper, in this case the Wallace Guardian chopper. Because the tip of the instrument is blunt, it can be used to hold back the posterior capsule for critical steps. For FACO energy, I prefer to use a micropulse approach, here shown with the Bausch & Lomb Stellaris system, which is coupled with a dual linear foot pedal that allows simultaneous and separate control of both vacuum and FACO power. This allows the addition of FACO power in very minimal and very limited doses. Step four in performing consistent cataract surgery is getting compulsive about a clean capsule. Being thorough and complete in capsule cleanup is even more important than the way you remove the nucleus because residual cortical material is what causes lens capsule contraction, which is what leads to variability in the effective lens position. The Capsule Guard silicone IA handpiece from stores, which has a 45 degree angle tip, is really useful for removing challenging or sticky cortical remnants because it has a soft tip that protects even fragile capsules during manipulation and allows us to intentionally capture a portion of the capsule to thoroughly clean it without doing damage. Rotating this tip creatively allows us to approach sub-incisional cortex safely as well. It's very hard to get into trouble with this instrument, so I like it a lot. Another useful instrument for achieving consistent healing is the Whitman Shepherd Capsule Polisher. This is a two-ended instrument that has one tip angle to the left and one to the right to allow complete 360 degree anterior or posterior capsule polishing. It's ideal for cleaning sticky cortex or lens epithelial cells that can be risky to remove with a metal IA tip. It's got rings that are semi-sharp on both the top and the bottom to provide just the right amount of disruption to break the adhesion of lens epithelial cells to the capsular bag. These final bits of debris that are released can then be easily removed by the capsule guard IA tip. Here we'll be implanting a crystal lens, and because this lens has a unique shape, we'll talk about how best to implant it. First, fill the capsule fully with a cohesive viscoelastic like AMBISC. This gives us plenty of room for the lens insertion, as well as easy removal of the viscoelastic. Once the injector is placed in the eye, and here we see the crystal cert system, we advance the leading haptics into the capsule and confirm that the round-ended haptic is on the right. We point the injector posteriorly so that the leading haptics will follow the curve of the capsule around anteriorly. This allows us to place the trailing haptics of this very long lens into and behind the sub-incisional capsular rim. Once the lens is fully inside the capsule, you can then position it and rotate it with the soft silicone IA tip without fear of damaging its surface or damaging the posterior capsule. You can also reach behind the lens to remove any residual viscoelastic that could be hiding there. With a crystal lens, it's worthwhile to rotate the lens, again with the silicone IA tip. This confirms that the lens is fully inside the capsule, and it also encourages the haptics to come to rest in the equatorial capsule. And finally, it may loosen any strands of cortex that are hiding out of sight. Step five is sealing the wound carefully. This is important with any lens, and with crystal lens in particular. I like to use stromal hydration with a blunt cannula to help seal the wound. And if it's necessary, we can place a suture. I use a single interrupted 10 nylon at the limbus. I like to leave the knot on the surface at the limbus and remove this suture at one day. By that time, the epithelium has sealed over the wound and it's really prevented any ingress or egress of fluid, which is what we're concerned about. I hope these five steps of performing predictable cataract surgery will help you to improve your surgical technique and the results you can give your patients. I'm Dr. John Hovanesian. Thanks for watching.